Well, good evening, everyone. Um, as I said, my name is Malik Mays. I have the honor today to introduce a good friend of mine and our speaker for the lecture series. Um, our guest speaker today is none other than Antonio Jackson. He is a former medical student from here at the University of Toledo College of Medicine class of 2022. He is a current emergency medicine resident at Emory University located in Atlanta, Georgia. Antonio is from Stockbridge, Georgia, by way of Virginia Beach, Virginia. He attended Morehouse College for his undergraduate education, where he was able to pinpoint and further develop his passion for diversity and inclusion. Antonio received his master's degree in biomedical sciences from Barry University in Miami, Florida, before matriculating to UTLEO for his medical education. It was here at Barry University where Antonio and two other classmates truly realized the difficulties many underrepresented minorities pursuing careers in medicine faced. Some of these difficulties included lack of mentorship, decreased level of support and belief from pre-medical advisors, and less access to necessary resources to be successful on this journey. Out of this realization, creating opportunities for diversity and equity in medicine, also known as Code Med, was founded. It is Antonio's hope today that to shed light on the importance and efficacy of longitudinal mentorship in URMs and how this can improve equity in medicine. Please join us in welcoming Dr. Antonio Jackson. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for that introduction, Malik. Uh, hey, everybody, um, super excited to be here. Um, thank you for giving me this opportunity, Dr. Jenkins. Um, I'll go ahead and hop right into it. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so the importance of mentorship and how mentorship impacts equity in medicine. Um, for many of you who do not know, uh, this topic is uh, very near and dear to my heart because I feel like I definitely would not be where I'm at um, in this moment uh, if it wasn't for mentorship that I've had um, throughout my journey to medicine and my life in general. I have no disclosures. So when I started, when, when Dr. Jenkins reached out to me and asked if I'd be willing to give uh, this talk, this is exactly how I felt, um, very happy and excited, but also, I guess, somewhat confused looking um, because I didn't really know how I would get this point across because I think a lot of people understand um, that mentorship is important. So when I uh, began just kind of crafting this presentation, I went back and thought like, where did mentorship start for me? And for me, that happened to be my father. Um, my dad is and is and will always be my very first mentor. And I credit him for a lot of the success that I've had specifically due to the morals and values that I feel he was able to kind of uh, impart on me um, during my childhood, uh, even up to this, this very day. Um, but no, my dad was not a physician. My dad actually was in the military and he spent 20 years serving the United States Navy. Um, and again, really gave, gave me a lot of information, a lot of knowledge, a lot of support, um, exactly what you would expect a mentor to do. And little did I know that information that he was giving me and that I was able to, you know, kind of put in action. I had someone else looking up at me, which happened to be my little brother who you can see right there to the left of my father. And although I didn't notice it, you know, uh, when I was younger, I became a mentor to my little brother and a role model to my little brother, um, where he's at this point, essentially following in my footsteps, um, applying to medical school this year. Um, and it's again, because of those morals and values that my father instilled in me and that I was able to portray that I think my little brother is also able to kind of follow along my footsteps and, and be in a position where he is uh, at this moment. So I say all that to say, overall, my, my hope and my goal today is to really est uh, establish the point that mentorship is extremely important, especially for those who are underrepresented in medicine. And if we are able to truly hone in and tap in to longitudinal mentorship, uh, I truly feel that this will impact equity in medicine, as well as uh, create uh, better outcomes for all of our patients, which is our overall goal um, as being uh, physicians or health professionals in general. So let's just talk some numbers. 
This slide here is, strict, uh, is directly from the AAMC, and this tells you the percentage of applicants um, to U.S. medical schools in 2018, 2019. And as you can see, 46%, about 47% are white, and then 21.3% are Asian. So close to 70 to 75% of the applicants um, applying to medical school are either white or Asian. That number significantly decreases when you look at um, Black or African American, Hispanic and Latino, and then other um, underrepresented minorities in medicine like Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander. Kind of continuing on with numbers, I think these are some really important uh, graphs that actually depict um, a 40 year span of medicine. And specifically, this graph on the left shows the difference between men and women enrolling into medical school between 1980 and 2019, again, a 40 year span. Um, the, you can see that about 75% of enrollees into medical school in 1980 were men and about 25% were women. That number did close or become more equal or equitable in uh, about 2004, 2005. And there all actually was a period where there were more, more women enrolled in medical school uh, than men. If you shift your focus to the right side of the screen, you'll see four different graphs that um, go into a little bit more detail, but over the same time period of 40 years, which depict uh, the, the percentage of black men, black women, Hispanic men and Hispanic women over that period of time. As you can see, all of these percentages are low in general, and that has essentially remained the case over these uh, 40, this 40-year 40 time period. Specifically looking at black women, there was there has been a slight increase from around 2.5% to maybe 4% or somewhere around there. Um, but if you look at black men, it's pretty subtle, but there's actually been a slight decrease from around uh, 3.1 or 3.2% to about 2.6%, again, over 40, over 40 years. And if you look at Hispanic men and Hispanic women, those numbers have really not changed very much over 40 years. You might appreciate a, a pretty significant dip on both of the Hispanic men and Hispanic women's, uh, these charts here. And the reason for this drop is actually um, around 2005, the AAMC created an opportunity for um, people to identify as uh, more than one race. And that significantly dropped the percentage of applicants who were, uh, who identify solely as Hispanic. So all those graphs that you just, um, or charts that you just saw um, are essentially in word form right here. And this was a special report for, again, diversity of the national medical student body over four, specifically over 40 years, um, entitled Four Decades of Inequities. Um, and as we saw in that very first graph, you know, uh, around 2005, we were able to see the attainment of gender parity. And that has, um, for the most part, remained pretty, pretty consistent over since that point. Um, with that being said, though, a large population um, of that cohort, of all cohorts, um, are still disproportionately white and Asian women. And then, um, specifically, you know, the uh, the percentage of women enrollees from racial and ethnic uh, diverse backgrounds have remained well below the corresponding percentages in the U.S. Census. Um, Moving forward to uh, the male enrollees, for those who are uh, who identify as um, from a racial or ethnic uh, background, they remain. There was limited progress in um, their enroll and their enrollment overall, um, and that was specifically noted as in black men, with starting at three point one percent in about nineteen seventy eight, to actually a decrease to two point nine percent in 2019. And then again, 
for Hispanic men and Hispanic women, they remain underrepresented over this entire uh, time period. So with me setting the stage there, I just wanna kind of pose a question. Here you have three different students, student A, student B, and student C. And below you see what their undergraduate GPAs were. Student A has a 3.08 overall GPA with a 2.76 science GPA. Student B has a 3.05 and a 2.62. And student C has a 3.8 and a 3.3 over uh, science GPA. And if somebody could unmute themselves and just tell me what you think uh, their pre-medical advisors um, advice would be to them as an undergraduate student telling that advisor that, hey, I want to go to medical school. Just anyone, please let me know what you think this advice would be. Or I'll call on somebody. I don't have the chat open, so. I can say something. Um, I think for student A and B, they'd probably tell them to not <laughs> and then student c they'd probably say go for it but they would rather them have a higher science gpa okay so all right cool so now you see that each student decided to get a master's degree Student A and student B had 4.0 and 3.82 respectively, and then student C also had a 4.0. They also all took the MCAT, and as you can see, student A had a 4, 497, student B had a 491, and then retook it and got a 500, and then student C had a 506. Uh, so what do you think, and they, none of them have applied to medical school at this point, what do you think uh, their advisor would say at this point? I guess that the advisor most likely would tell them to take the MCAT again before applying to a stringular application. Okay. So in these scenarios, um, student A was told to not apply to medical school. Uh, student B was also told to not apply to medical, medical school. And student C was told that they might have a chance to go to medical school. They just might. And in that, in those scenarios, uh, I myself was student A, Kwesi Abouage was student B, and the Dear Little Man was student C. Um, as you all know, I am a current first year resident at Emory University, emergency medicine resident. Uh, Kwesi Abouage, who is pictured to the left of the screen, is a current fourth year medical student at Temple University in Philly. And he recently just matched into anesthesiology at UT Houston in Houston, Texas. And Adir Lillman is a fourth year medical student at uh, University of Miami in Miami, Florida. And she uh, recently just matched into med peds at Baylor College of Medicine. And if each one of us would have just listened to that one pre-med advisor uh, that gave us the information of like, hey, you probably aren't going to be able to do this. You probably should look at another uh, career option. Um, we wouldn't be able to, we wouldn't have been able to form this organization, Code Med. So just a little bit more background about Code Med. Um, the inception of Code Med began at Barry University simply because we all were receiving information from outside resources, um, pre-medical pre advisors at some of our um, undergraduate institutions, and things just didn't really seem right. They didn't seem like they were adding up. So because of that, we began to do our own research, but also reaching out to find other mentors, reaching out to other people who might have a little bit more updated information on this journey to medical school and how to attain and acceptance to medical school because that was our number one goal and that's what our dreams were. So out of that, again, um, we were able to all gain an acceptance to medical school. Um, and I specifically remember one of my mentors at the time, Dr. Keith Jones, who's a, he was a vascular surgeon at 
uh, the University of Miami. I remember when I finally got accepted, I was, ex I was super excited and I told him, I was like, I don't know how I'll ever repay you. And he told me, you can't, but what you can do is you can reach back and you can help the next student who's in the same position that you were in at one point in time. So when I think about that now, um, I think about the fact that he essentially was saying, you know, don't give a student a fish, but rather teach them how to fish, right? So this was sidebar. This was a, a very great day of uh, fishing for me. Um, but that's essentially what our plan is or what our goal is and our hope is, is that we are able to teach these mentees who are trying to apply to medical school how to fish, how to gather information or research for themselves how to ultimately get into medical school, but also take these same skills that they're um, that they need to get into medical school and be successful in medical school and beyond. Um, which I think is a, a very important piece to um, our overall uh, program. So our mission for Code Med is to develop a platform to provide application assistance specifically to underserved and underrepresented minorities who are pursuing careers in medicine. We also aim to promote diversity within medical institutions and um, in a larger scheme, aid in the elimination of health disparities. Specifically, what do we do? We help these students with every single aspect of the application. We meet students where they're at. So that includes the general application review, interview strategies. Uh, we develop a personalized timeline, which I'll talk about a little bit more um, later on. We give MCAT guidance, networking advice, uh, and we also help with their pieces of writing, including their personal statements and extracurricular activities. One of the more important pieces to all of this, though, in my opinion, is the fact that it's free, right? So we recognize that a huge burden that underrepresented minorities face when um, pursuing medicine is the fact that everything costs money. That includes applying to medical school, as we know, is extremely expensive, buying MCAT books. Um, and if you decide that you do need outside uh, help with a personal statement, there are other programs out there who do this, but a lot of them charge. You know, um, MCAT, MCAT courses, they charge. So we felt that it was extremely important to us as we were, again, once in this situation that we don't charge a dime for the services that we provide. Um, it's also important here to note that each and every mentor in Code Med is a medical student. So not only are we doing this work for free, but we are also, all, each mentor is a medical student. And as we know, medical school is extremely busy. So we are essentially donating our time um, because this is something that's, you know, very, that we're all very passionate about and we feel very strongly about, not only because we want to see the numbers of underrepresented minorities in medicine increase, but more so because we want to see better care given to the patient populations in which we serve. So this here is actually, I think, a very good um, experiment that highlights exactly why we do what we do. And this experiment was done in Oakland, California. And what they did was they took um, a, a number of black men who um, needed to have some kind of uh, primary care visit and they paired them with black physicians or non-black physicians. And the purpose of this was to um, see if they could increase adherence to preventative care um, and also uh, potentially more invasive screenings. Um, and overall, what they found was that you can see highlighted in orange, black doctors could reduce cardiovascular mortality by 16 deaths per 100,000 per year, which accounted for 19% of the black white gap in cardiovascular related deaths. What I think is more interesting here though, is that if they would have continued to extrapolate that data even further, um, they believe that, that um, information would have been a lot stronger and larger um, to areas that are much more that are also more pre uh, preventable, um, specifically things like cancer and HIV AIDS. So what does that tell you? 
Um, it tells you that having physicians who look like you is important, not only for the people who are, not only for those who are treating the patients, but overall to get better outcomes uh, for our patients that we're serving. So I just wanna quickly touch on what a general workflow for each of the co-med mentors looks like. Um, again, because like I said, these are all medical students who are putting in this work and putting in this time to help these pre-medical students. So essentially we have each potential mentee fill out an advise me assessment form. Once that occurs, they get a mentor assigned to them. That mentor will review their information in detail and they do an initial intake meeting with that, ment with that mentee. Once they do that, they develop a personalized application timeline. And then from there, they have periodic check-ins depending on what, that, what the needs are of that specific mentee. So that might include uh, general, just general updates on how their journey is going, um, personal statement, extracurricular advice or revisions, definitely MCAT advice. But one of the more important things that I think of is just vent sessions. So as we know, this process can be extremely taxing on um, the pre-medical student, especially when you're dealing with things like imposter syndrome and feeling like, hey, I can't do this or I don't belong. So I think these vent sessions are extremely important because we are able to give a lot of reassurance that, hey, you do belong here, you absolutely can do this, and this is how we're gonna make this happen. Eventually, these applicants are ready to submit an application. We do a complete application review. They get interview invitations. We do mock interviews with them, as many as it takes to have them ready for the actual interview, and then ultimately medical school acceptance. So as I've talked about before, um, we develop these timelines that we believe are extremely essential to the success um, that we've had with our mentees up to this point. And these timelines are all individualized and personalized to the mentee that you are working with. What we've realized over the few years um, that we've been doing co-med is that a lot of times the planning and applying to medical school is a huge burden for the mentees. A lot of people decide to start in March or April and working on their personal statement or their extracurricular activity descriptions or reaching out for letters of recommendation. And they become extremely overwhelmed, end up pushing the MCAT back and have to start over the next cycle and spend more and more and more money, which we want to prevent. So um, we develop these timelines that they can use as a guide to sit back and start extremely early and tack away at this overall application process, because as we know, this application process is like a year long process um, and they can tack away bit by bit, piece by piece um, from very early on. So that way, when it comes down to March, April, May, June, they're not as stressed. They can focus solely on the MCAT and ultimately do well on the MCAT and be able to apply to medical school early. That is always our goal is to have our applicants ready to apply to medical school as early as possible, specifically June 1st, if they can. And then something else to mention about these timelines is this here is our goal timeline, which shows if a student applies um, a year, or excuse me, if a student reaches out to us a year before they're ready to apply. We also have application, or excuse me, timelines that are geared toward six months. We also have some that are geared toward three months or nine months. So it just depends on when they reach out to us. Again, ensuring that we meet students exactly where they're at. So let's talk some numbers about COMED. As you can see here, again, we started CoMed in 2019, and up to this point, these numbers might be a little um, higher now, but um, we've had 387 uh, people, 387 potential advisees fill out the advisee assessment form. And I think what that tells us is that there's a need, right? There's a need for what we do because there's a very large number of people who are reaching out to us. And this number is, is, is again, steady growing. Um, so I think that there's still a need for what we do. Out of the 387, 
we have 151 who have been able to submit medical school applications. And out of those 151 who've submitted applications, we've been able to get uh, up to this point, 81 um, total acceptances. Now this number actually might be a little bit higher now because I think we've had a few more mentees who have, since I put this presentation together, reach out and let us know that they've been accepted to medical school this current cycle. Um, other numbers that I wanna to touch on and I'll touch on a little bit more in detail later is that we do have um, 109 quote unquote inactive mentees. And then we still have a, um, a current number of 197 active mentees. Now these active mentees are those who are either currently in this application cycle now, or those who um, are not quite yet ready to apply, but they will be applying in one of the uh, cycles upcoming, maybe this upcoming cycle or the cycle after that. Um, so that's uh, a, a, a still a, a good amount of mentees, active mentees um, that we feel very strongly will ultimately gain acceptance to medical school. So 54%, this is the percentage of accepted students out of those who have been able to submit an application up to this point um, through CODEMED. And again, I think this number is, might be a couple percent, percentage points higher at this point. But um, I think this is a really great number for us that you know we're over 50% of students who have come through CODEMED and who have submitted applications have gained acceptance to medical school. Uh, specifically recognizing that some of these um, mentees who we have feel like they didn't have a chance before they filled out this application. A lot of them felt, hey, this was my last hope and they've been able to gain acceptance. So this is a number that we're extremely proud of, but also a number that we're working to increase even more. And as I talk, touched on earlier, we do have a percentage of inactive mentees, specifically 28% uh, of the total mentees who have ever submitted a, a mentee uh, or an advisee acceptance or an advisee form um, are considered quote unquote inactive. Um, talk, touching on that a little bit more, why? Why are people quote unquote inactive? And the short answer is this journey is not easy. Okay. So um, a large portion of the, those of that 28% actually comes down to there not being a response after the initial submission of the mentee form. And this is an area that we're working on to see, hey, is there something we can do better to ensure that they actually do uh, follow up once we um, reach, out, reach out to them um, once they submit this form? Maybe it's uh, just something that, you know, it's the mode of communication that we use, which for us is usually email. Maybe there's a better way we can do that. And that's something we've actively been um, kind of working on to see if we can kind of fix that problem and decrease the amount of inactive mentees from that perspective. There's also a number of inactive mentees that occur after the initial mentor intake session. And sometimes that's simply, they feel that, hey, maybe this is a little bit much. Maybe I don't think I'm ready at this point to tackle this journey. Um, but again, this is something that we're also actively working on. And then there's a, a, a number of people who decide, hey, this might not be the career for me. That might mean they want to switch to another health profession, whether that is becoming a CRNA or whether that's becoming um, another, a, a nurse or a physician assistant. But then there's others who decide like, hey, medicine is not for me. I actually like tech. You know, I specifically remember one mentee who was doing extremely well, excuse, excuse me, extremely well, and then decided, hey, I think tech might be a better fit for me and, and what I want to do and what the impact I want to make. So um, that's also a, a reason why we have a number of inactive mentees. And then quote unquote subpar metrics. So that specifically, when I speak of this, that might mean some of these mentees have taken the MCAT a number of times, four or five, six different times, um, even sometimes before, most of the time before reaching out to our um, organization, or they've done um, undergrad and they've done graduate school and or post back, and for whatever reason, their MCATs, or excuse me, their GPAs have remained extremely low. 
And from that perspective, they will be fighting an extremely, extremely uphill battle to gain acceptance. As we do know that um, a part of this journey is still ensuring that your metrics are uh, strong enough to demonstrate that you have the capacity to do well and the ability to do well um, in medical school in general. And it's also, I wanna be very clear here though, we do not um, exclude any mentee who fills out the application form. It doesn't matter how high or how low your GPA is, how high or how low your MCAT score is, we accept every single mentee and we work with them longitudinally, excuse me, longitudinally um, as best we can um, and as, will, as hard as they are willing to work in order to get them accepted to medical school. So up to this point, COMED has been able to help mentees be accepted to over 75 different medical schools, um, both MD and DO, um, over 25, within over 25 different states um, across the United States, and even um, three different Caribbean medical schools. And I think the point of this slide here is one to say, hey, yes, our students are getting accepted. What we're doing is working, but also to recognize that we truly have our uh, mentees apply very, very, very broad. We don't discriminate between MD and DO. Whatever their preference is, is what we go for, but we 100% advocate for students to apply very broad, apply both MD and DO. Um, and ultimately it shows that because they're accept they've been accepted to so many different schools. And as you can see here, um, there's a wide range of places students have been accepted from schools in Arizona to um, schools in Chicago, um, North Carolina, you know, um, the Midwest, you name it. We have students all over the United States at this point. Um, and then that just kind of continues. As you can see, we even have students who have come through and matriculated to the University of Toledo. Right. So again, we have students, we have our students apply extremely broad and we are very proud of the different institutions that they've been able to gain acceptance to up to this point. I think here's a, a was a very appropriate time to put some faces to what I'm talking about. Right. So each and every one of these people these students, these current medical students that you see on this screen are one of the mentees that we've had through Code Med. And each of them took the time to reach out to us because they felt that we had something that could potentially benefit them on their journey. So I just wanted to take a moment just to, you know, put some faces to what I'm talking about because I think this makes it a lot more real um, and tangible for um, for you all today listening. More specifically, though, I'd like to highlight a few people who I consider, quote unquote, Toledo's very own. Starting in the middle, this is Catherine Amengo, who's a current third year medical student at the University of Toledo, who again came through COMED and ultimately chose to matriculate at uh, matriculate um, here at Toledo at University of Toledo. Over here on the left, we have Kaylee Story, who's a current first year medical student who also came through COMED and matriculated to the University of Toledo. And then over here on the right, um, we have Tatiana White, uh, pictured with the famous Dean Cooper, um, who again is a first year medical student who decided to matriculate here at the, the University of Toledo. And I just want to again highlight something that I think is extremely important um, with Tatiana White, who um, I'm going to embarrass her slightly here, but um, Tatiana was our very first mentee in co-med. Again, we started in 2019 um, and she was the very first mentee to fill out the form and she was my very first mentee in co-med. And Tatiana truly embodies the characteristics or the qualities of hard work, persistence, and dedication. Because again, she started in 2019 uh, feeling like, hey, I don't know where to go, but I know that I wanna be a medical student. I know that I wanna be a physician. And she truly 
entrusted co-med and specifically entrusted me to guide her on this journey. Um, so I'd like to think that I did play a small role in her deciding to matriculate here at the University of Toledo when I know she had multiple options to choose from. So I just wanted to kind of mention that and show the importance of longitudinal mentorship. So something that we are working on with CoMed is something called the CoMed Pipeline. And pipelining program, program, pipeline programming is extremely important. And I think we know that. And on the next slide, I'll kind of talk about um, again, how that, how pipeline programming can impact equity in medicine, but specifically, you know, we have a goal to develop relationships with medical schools across the nation and provide these medical schools with a ready source of unrepresented minority applicants who are academically prepared, academically sound, who have strong applications and are mission aligned for each of these respective institutions. And the reason we want to build these these pipelines is because we do recognize that a lot of medical institutions say that, hey, we are truly trying to increase our diversity, but sometimes we don't really know how. Or sometimes, you know, uh, it seems like we're doing everything we can, but we can't figure out how to land these students. And I'm just here to say that through CoMed, this is a very ready source um, of, of minority applicants who will who are, who will be ready and um, able to matriculate to said institution. So we are currently working with a number of different medical schools um, to create a again a pipeline program um, that provides assistance um, with recruitment and ultimately increasing their numbers of underrepresented minorities uh, in medicine at their specific institutions. But why? Why is this even uh, important? So this here is a quote from the CEO of John Hopkins, um, John Hopkins Medicine. And it reads that this is not just about quote unquote fairness, but diversity in medicine has measurable benefits. Studies have shown that students who are one trained at diverse schools are more comfortable treating patients from a wide range of ethnic backgrounds, which me being um, currently being a first year resident um, in an area that is extremely diverse um, in the city of Atlanta, um, I can 100% attest to um, this statement. Also, when physicians of the same race as that patient um, excuse me, when the physician is the same race of that patient, patients have reported high levels of trust and satisfaction. The visits even last longer by 2.2 minutes on average. And, um, you know, specifically just when, when patients enter the hospital, they absolutely deserve to see physicians, um, you know, who resemble them. Um, and this here, I think, directly correlates back to that study that was done in Oakland, California, that specifically showed that, hey, um, those black men who saw um, black physicians absolutely had the ability to have, you know, their cardiovascular deaths um, or the percentage of the cardiovascular deaths decreased. Um, so I think that is extremely, um, I think this is like correlation um, and causation, and um, for lack of a better term. And then again, all of this matters if we are going to start chipping away at the troubling health disparities we see um, in whatever region of medicine that uh, you're practicing. So with that being said, Code Med, just like a many, many other uh, organizations, truly believe that each medical school within the United States should aim at minimum to strive to have their incoming class match the US population. And this is at a minimum. Um, so as you can see, um, almost 19% of the US population is Hispanic or Latino. And I truly do not believe that majority of the medical schools across the United States have 19% of their 
um, incoming medical school class to be Hispanic or Latino, right? But I do think that this is something that each medical school class should actively strive to achieve. That's the same with the Black or African American population. Um, you know, majority of these medical medical school classes do not um, have close to thirteen percent. You are, or excuse me, close to thirteen percent um, Black or African American uh, incoming medical students. Again, I think this is something that we should one hundred percent strive to achieve. But with that being said, I don't think that, let's say, your institution does reach uh, this milestone. Um, I don't think we should stop there. I think we should aim to set the standard and be the standard. So that means specifically thinking about Lucas County. Um, Lucas County might have an underrepresented minority population um, between both uh, Black and African American and Hispanic of maybe 20 to 30 percent. So, you know, I think here at the University of Toledo, it'd be great to see um, the overall size of, or excuse me, the overall makeup of the class strive to reflect what the uh, population of Lucas County um, might look like, right? Um, so I guess the point of this and the point of this entire presentation is not to get you to uh, say like, hey, yeah, mentorship is important because I think everyone knows that. But the point of this, uh, presentation, at least from my perspective, and the part that I really hope everyone is understanding is that by increasing the number of diverse medical students at our institutions, we will inherently create a more equitable um, environment for our patients that we are serving. And that overall is the goal that we should have when we are treating these patients once we become physicians in whatever respective specialty that we go into. So with that, thank you for your time. I truly appreciate this opportunity and I am open for any questions. Thank you again, Dr. Jackson for a, a fantastic presentation. Again, any um, questions for Dr. Jackson? What are some ways that, um people can support code med if we wanted to uh that's a great that's a great question um so <clears throat> there's a few different ways people can support code med um one way is financially right if you go to codemed20.com um, you can always donate financially to code med and what is that money used for it's used to assist our application or excuse me our, our applicants our mentees with their applications, right? So sometimes applicants might only be able to apply to 10 schools, right? Because they just don't have the financial uh, uh, bandwidth to apply to more. And as we know, sometimes applying to only 10 schools, you know, can handicap you, right? Especially when majority of people are applying to a lot more. So um, that we also, when we uh, receive funds, we purchase MCAT books, the most recent MCAT books, um, whether it's Kaplan or Princeton Review or whatever the case may be for our mentees. We also help to fund them to go to different conferences that might be beneficial for them as pre-med students. Uh, one of those conferences absolutely includes the SNMA or Student National Medical Association's AMEC conference or RMEC conference for their specific region uh, that they might uh, actually live in. So um, one way is absolutely uh, financially. Um, and then another way is if you have books, if you have resources that you do not use anymore, we'd love for you to donate those resources, no matter how old or how, no matter how new, um, because again, there are many of our mentees who simply don't have the funds to buy these books or these resources and it does put them at a handicap when they're trying to study for a test like the MCAT um, that is extremely difficult to study for in general when you have all the resources. So we could just imagine how difficult it is if you don't even have resources at all. Um, so those are a few ways that that um, people can help. I have a quick question. Um, if we know a student that is interested in applying in medical school, 
Um, do we direct them to the code med website or how do we help them start the process and the, getting the application completed? Absolutely. So there's two ways that these um, any pre-medical student who's reaching out for advice or uh, would love our to utilize our services. There's two ways that they can reach out. Excuse me. One is um, by going directly to the website, comed20.com. And there's a, um, they can click on a link that says um, how to become a mentee. And they will ultimately, if they scroll down, there'll be in uh, a Google form that they can click on and fill out. And then one of the mentors will reach out to them um, within a reasonable amount of time to um, have, again, that intake and get the process started from that perspective. Another way that they can uh, reach out is by reaching out on our Instagram, um, which is codemed20, at codemed20 on Instagram. And there's the link is directly in the bio and they can um, reach out from that perspective as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Jackson. This is uh, such an important um, program. I'm so glad you're sharing that with our community. Um, we are all very uh, proud of you and the work that you've done. Um, your work is going to become even more important as we are obviously in the admissions community nationwide as we prepare for a post affirmative action uh, environment uh, coming up probably this summer. Um, I wonder if you can speak a little bit to um, how, how are you um, or are you um, doing anything to engage with those gatekeepers, with those gatekeepers in, in the uh, undergraduate colleges? I mean, you mentioned pre-health advisors uh, to the extent that a uh, university has a pre-med advising office in the first place. How do we reach those folks? Yeah, so um, that's a really, a really great question. And um, the, we absolutely are, um, we absolutely do engage this community as well, um, specifically by just reaching out to either uh, those the institutions that we came from and talking to them, you know, just based off of the relationships that we've developed. A lot of what we do is truly based off of uh, the networks and the relationships that we've developed over since 2019 or before, um, honestly. But we've had talks with them on, you know, creating um, literature or even holding sessions for the pre med advisors who to kind of update them on this journey because a lot of times. They are not aware of the updates, you know, that or the the more, um, I guess, up to date information on simply how to get students accepted to medical school. You know, again, if you go back to looking at my journey specifically, um, majority of the medical uh, advisors would have told me, like, absolutely not, do not apply to medical school, you know, with a 497 um, MCAT score, you know, and because I had other mentors who had been through this process and who have seen multiple people be accepted with that number, you know, I felt that that was extremely beneficial to me. So we are definitely engaging um, the pre-med advisors from that perspective, but something else that we hope to do is again, put together uh, more literature and or sessions uh, with these advisors to figure out what they feel their specific um, pitfalls or handicaps might be in helping their students specifically get into medical school and then seeing how we can specifically help them um, from our perspective. So we absolutely are engaged in this community. And I think that's gonna be, like you said, extremely important in this possible like post affirmative action um, era that we're getting ready to kind of move into. But with that being said, I also think it's very important for the medical schools to recognize that, um, you know, there are, excuse me, there are organizations such as CoMed who are preparing these um, mentees or these applicants uh, to the best of our ability and the best of their ability to be ready um, to apply a, to submit a very strong application to their medical school and really take that in, into consideration and you know hopefully offer these students these interviews and ultimately acceptances to their institutions. All right, I want to make sure that we respect everyone's time. Um, with that, thank you again, Dr. Jackson, for your presentation. And I'm sure you'll be happy to answer any 
further questions in the future about code mental health support, but we really appreciate your time today. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you. Have a nice night, everyone. Thank you.